All right, everyone, thanks for joining us this morning. This is Laura from the CCSA. Hope you all had a great weekend. Uh, we're happy to welcome uh, Tom McInerney from the Edward Orton Jr. Ceramic Foundation today. And um, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, so you may hear Tom say, Laura, turn the page, or next page, Laura. So just ignore those. Just so you know, everybody has been muted on here. Uh, and um, that's to avoid excessive background noises and distractions. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat window, and we will answer those at the end of the webinar. So, um, Tom, I'm going to let you take it away from here. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, everybody, for uh, logging in. Uh, my name, again, is Tom McInerney. I'm a ceramic engineer with the Orton Ceramic Foundation. Uh, Laura, I think what I'll do is I'll just say the word slide whenever I want the uh, slides to be moved on, and uh, that'll be my indication for you. Uh, so welcome, everybody. This is Orton's seminar on successful firing slide. And what we do at Orton is we help with the uh, products called pyrometric cones, kiln vents, uh, temperature controllers, and we also have a materials testing lab. So if you've got a firing problem, we hopefully have the solution for you. Slide. So this seminar, called Successful Firing Practices, is designed to provide useful information on firing. So we all know it's disappointing to spend time and money preparing a piece only to have it turned out poorly when it's fired. So like most activities, certain guidelines exist for firing. And in this seminar, we refer to these as key firing principles. So there is no one way to fire all your products. One must adapt their firing practices to the type of products being fired and the kiln that you're using. So firing is a learned skill that can be continuously enhanced and improved. Slide. We're going to talk in three parts on this uh, webinar. And we're going to talk about, first, how uh, your kiln fires. We're going to talk a little bit about the kiln controls the temperature distribution that you'll see in your kiln, and how you use kiln, the cones in each firing. Slide. So the second part, we're going to talk about how to understand what's happening in, to the wear that you're firing. We're going to try and help to develop a firing schedule and go a little bit into depth about what happens during the firing. And lastly, we're going to talk about the use of venting, and is it important? Slide. And lastly, we're going to get into the problems that you might encounter with uh, when you're firing your kilns, and you can use these problems to help you to adjust your firing practices. So don't look at a problem as purely, oh my gosh, I've totally messed up and there's nothing I can, can do further. You can learn from this, and we can apply it to uh, give you some knowledge on what to do going forward. Slide. So there uh, may seem obvious that uh, this, uh, these principles that I mentioned, but it's surprising how many misunderstandings or myths exist about firing. So usually, firing is your wear is not difficult, but it is easier to understand what can occur and what can be done to measure and minimize these firing problems. So let's look at some of these myths that that uh, are perpetuated through the industry. Uh, one of them is that kilns, all kilns, are uniform in their temperature. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that later. We'll also talk about the heating rate. And is that they say that it is not important. I'll show you that it is. Electronic controllers are foolproof. Therefore, I don't need to use cones. Uh, we're going to get into the reason for using cones and why they are important. Uh, we're going to talk about temperature. And the myth then that is associated with that one is that you can just pick a temperature and you can fire it to it. You don't need to use a cone. And I'll show you why that is not the case. And then we're going to get into venting and why is that, in, why is that actually necessary. Slide. So the more you know and understand about how your kiln operates, the easier it is going to be to make successful firings. Slide. So you have different controls in kilns. And m the most basic 
that uh, kilns started out with were just switches, and they were started out as manual switches that you would turn either on low, medium, or high, or you would have uh, numbers on them from one being the lowest to ten being the highest, and you would adjust those as you would step through your firing. And they progressed from that point into automatic switches, which would cycle on their own and try to give the kiln uh, operator the opportunity or the ability to uh, ramp up this, the rate at which he's firing or she's firing. The next thing that came along was a, pro, uh, a switch called the kiln sitter. And the kiln sitters were designed to use a small parametric cone or a bar that would be sitting inside of the kiln and uh, there would be a little uh, metal fulcrum that uh, when, the key, when the cone would deform under the temperature that it was fired to, the fulcrum would drop down and release a switch on the outside of the kiln or a weight on the outside of the kiln that would hit a switch to turn the kiln off. And they were fairly reliable, but they were still not uh, easily controllable. They just uh, were on or off. Then came along electronic controllers. And the nice thing about the electronic controller is that it gave you a little more freedom. Slide. So you have different types of controllers. You have a basic one, which is going to use a single point of temperature measurement. It allows you to have a delay start, a programmed hold time if you want it, and it also adjusted the heating and cooling rates for you. This one you're seeing here is a simple three-button controller. Slide. They would move it in. If you wanted to go a little further, you could get into the advanced controllers, which have the ability to measure temperature on multi-zones, uh, up to three temperature controls. Uh, you also have the ability in the advanced controllers to have multiple programming options where you can put in your own program or you can use the, uh, the buttons on the controller to adjust the speed at which you're heating uh, depending upon the load size. And then there's also optional uh, fan controls and or switches uh, to allow you to turn on a plug either on or off. Slide. So what did the controllers allow you to do? They allow you to control your heating rate. And I will get into what that means later in a, in a couple of the uh, slides that I've got coming up. Uh, they allow you to adjust the final temperature based on the kiln load. So they, they have a, a computer chip that is met, programmed to adjust based on what the feedback is. Uh, received into the controller based on the, the temperature that is being read by the thermocouple. So if you have a very heavily loaded kiln and the kiln is, is struggling to catch up to the temperature that the controller is telling it to be at, it would adjust the temperature so that it fires to uh, precisely the cone value that you're asking it to go to. Uh, the nice uh, feature that is also associated with these temperature controllers is this cone fire mode that you may see a lot on them. And what is nice about a cone fire mode is you, you just type in what cone you are firing to and you tell it to start and the kiln will ramp up on the schedule that is already built into it for that particular cone fire. Slide. So, why do we use a controller? Well, we're wanting to regulate how fast the kiln heats and cools, and that is very important to make sure that you get success in your firing because the, heat, the rate at which you fire is very important for developing the properties that you want in the ceramic that you're firing. You also are allow, uh, given the ability to soak the kiln at a temperature that is lower than the uh, the, the particular target that you're going after, and that allows you the ability to eke even out the temperature distribution within the kiln. Uh, because kilns are not uniform in, the, in their firing, and because of the, uh, the nature of the way heat 
is radiated and uh, the, how the heating elements work to heat the wear that's inside the kiln, by putting the kiln at a slightly lower temperature than your target and soaking or holding at that specific temperature, it allows the kiln to even out in temperature without damaging or hurting the, the product. And it'll also, the biggest thing, I think, is the uh, ability to start this firing whenever it is more convenient for you. So you can put a delay on it and say, I want this uh, firing to start at 9 o'clock tonight so that when I come in the next morning, it is nearing its finishing. Uh, so that the whole, the whole thing is it provides you consistency. Slide. So are they consistent all the time? Well, let's talk about what affects a controller's performance. The whole thing that makes a controller work is a thermocouple. And a thermocouple is a, uh, a device that is comprised of two wires that are joined together. These wires are made up of slightly different compositions so that when they're welded together, they form a bead, and that bead is what you're placing in the kiln. The two ends of the wire that, you've, uh, that are not welded together are then connected to a controller, and that controller is reading an electronic signal. There's a little voltage that is generated across that welded junction, and that controller is registering or reading the amount of electrical current that is passing through that, that welded bead. And that controller takes and converts that signal into what we call temperature. So it, it'll depend upon the type of wire that the, the, the thermocouple is made out of, as well as the thickness of the wire, and how, lo how many times that wire or the thermocouple is exposed to temperature. So you will bring it up to temperature, it'll, it'll give you uh, the signal, and then once the kiln is uh, shut off, it cools down again. Every time you cycle that little piece of metal that the wires are made out of, it's going to cause some degradation or a uh, change to the electrical signal in the size of that bead because you're, you're going to uh, oxidize a little bit of metal, and the size of the, the welded piece is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller, and that affects the signal that is being generated by the uh, thermocouple. So there, therefore, it changes every time you fire the kiln. And it may not be drastic at first, but eventually it starts to degrade so that the signal is going to actually indicate a temperature lower than actual temperature. Um, when we talk about calibration of the controller, what we're talking about is making the controller turn that signal that is being generated from the thermocouple into a temperature that is valid. Uh, we know that water boils at 212 degrees. We also know that it freezes at, minus, at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So what we do when we send a, a controller out of our uh, business here is we're going to make sure that that thermocouple and controller are measuring that properly. So when you have the kiln shut off, you're going to see that the thermocouple reading should be giving you a temperature that is pretty close to what room temperature is. If you see something that's off, say it's reading uh, like 95 degrees and you know that it's 72 degrees in your, in your room, then there's, there's an indication that the calibration of the controller is off. When we talk lastly here about age and type of contactor, we're talking about the switch that turns that opens and closes every time the controller tells the uh, tells the current to be turned on or off to the heating elements, and we call that a relay. And there are most of the kilns today now contain a solid state relay. And if you hear your kiln clicking on and off inside of the controller box, that's usually what you hear is the relay opening and closing. 
every time it opens, it's letting current pass through to the heating elements, and every time it clicks again, it shuts the current off. So uh, that cycling that, that occurs over and over and over will start to uh, become less and less effective as the relay ages. So if you start to hear maybe a relay chattering instead of a good sharp click, you hear like a, a chattering effect, and that is an indication that your relay is starting to, to uh, wear out. Okay, slide. So here's a picture that I hopefully uh, gave justice to. It's a typical type K thermocouple that most of the uh, elec electronic controllers are utilizing nowadays. This is the part that is going to be protruding through the side of the kiln where that welded bead is going to be placed on the inside and the leads on the, that I've indicated, the negative and the positive, those are what you connect on, to the controller on the inside of your uh, controller box. If you need to reinstall one of these, it's, uh, I'm going to give you a real quick uh, tip on how to identify the type of wire that you're going to be attaching to each lead, because one of them is considered a positive and one of them is considered the negative lead. And the negative lead on a type K thermocouple is the one you attach the red wire to. The positive lead is the one you attach the yellow wire to. Now, this only applies to type K thermocouples. So if you cannot tell which lead is which, if you could get a magnet and attach the magnet or, or touch the magnet to each wire, the one the magnet sticks to is going to be your red lead. So that's the one you're going to make sure you attach to the red wire. That's my little tip for you, and hopefully that helps you if you ever get stuck. Slide. So why should cones still be used with a controller? Well, because of this degrading that goes on with the thermocouple, and or the calibration that needs to be made with the controller and the age of the relays, all of these things are what we consider to be drift, electronic drift. Over time and over time, uh, many uses, those electronic items are going to start to give you a temperature that actually is lower than the readout that's showing on the screen of the controller even though it may say you've, you've fired to a specific cone number properly, that's only if the controls are calibrated properly. And uh, hopefully I've been able to explain to you that that is not always going to be a stable situation. So most experienced ceramists were going to continue to use cones, and they're going to know that both the time and temperature is required to fire your ceramics properly. So this is probably my first time here mentioning time and temperature together. What we like to call these combined effect of time and temperature on the firing of your ceramics is a, is a term we call heat work. And heat work is, is uh, what we built into the uh, cone in its ability to measure temperature. And you're going to see here in a couple of slides later why the cone is not subject to the same electronic drift that you get with the controllers. Slide. So kilns are not uniform, and that uh, can be pretty well seen if you would perform this simple test that we, uh, we recommend for everybody who's getting a kiln. Uh, take a look at the temperature uniformity in your kiln at three different firing levels. You're going to look at the lowest temperature around cone 019, and you're going to step up to uh, your typical glaze firing temperature at cone 06. And then if you do do any high firing, uh, you could look at the performance of your kiln at cone 6. Now, the way you're going to do that slide is you're going to make test firings with these three cones to determine the temperature differences within your kiln. So if you have a large kiln, you may see as much as a one to two cone 
variation in in how the the uh, the kiln performs. Now, when we say a cone difference, what we're talking about is uh, if your target is cone number one, you may see that cone number two and cone number one could actually deform in some spots in your kiln. That could amount to a as much as a 20 to 40 degree centigrade difference in your kiln, and that could be pretty um, pretty large if you are firing some of these uh, new glazes that require very precise control. Um, what is also important is determine the firing time that you uh, typically get when you fire your kiln to either 019, 06, or cone 6, and those times are going to be different. Uh, it may take as much as uh, six hours to fire to an 06 to get a glaze firing. That may be as long as eight hours to get to cone six, and it could be done as few as uh, four hours to get an 019 firing. Slide. So what you want to do is you want to get yourself a logbook. You can either do this electronically, uh, where you set up something in your computer, or you, uh, with the advent of smartphones, you could take pictures with your phone and then email them to yourself. Um, whatever technique you do, uh, I highly recommend that you get to and record some of these in, this vital information. Uh, you're going to want to look at what happened to the cones when you fired, where were they placed in the kiln, and what kind of firing time and target cone were you, number were you going for, and was the kiln fully loaded, half loaded, and anything that is unusual. You want to make a note of that with each firing that you take. And um, when you look at the cones and you know what happened to the cones, uh, they're going to tell you something besides whether they bent over or not. And the appearance of the cone is uh, just as much as an important factor as how did it bend over. And I'm going to show you a slide here in a bit that will that'll hopefully demonstrate that. When you place your kilns in, or cones in the kiln, you want to try to make them uh, as close to the same position as, as possible. Uh, and in most of the kilns that you're using nowadays, you're going to have maybe two or three layers that you're going to be building of shelves. It's a good idea to put the cones in the, sh in the kiln, say, in the center of each shelf. And that way uh, you can be as consistent as possible with the placement of those cones. They, the location of where you place them will have an effect on how they perform. So as, if, as long as you stay consistent in what you're doing, you should be able to use them as a indicator of the effectiveness of your firing. The time, you're going to get that off of the electronic controller. When it finishes, you usually see an indication that it says the firing is complete. It'll tell you what cone number it was going to and what temperature and time it, it, uh, it's going to toggle between the time that it took to get to that firing and also the temperature that it ended up on. So you want to record those. Slide. So let's talk about a little bit uh, on these cones and, and how they're used. Uh, cones were invented for the primary purpose of measuring when a firing is complete. They were developed by Edward Orton in the mid-1890s uh, he, he actually took his work from work that was done in uh, France and Germany, uh, and he developed his own set of pyrometric cones back in the, uh, started making them in 1896 and selling them here in the United States. And uh, a cone is basically a, a slender, tapered pyramid made with carefully controlled ceramic materials, and we identify each one by a number. And in, and in several cases, we actually put some uh, food coloring in them to give you a, a little bit of color to help identify them as well. Otherwise, they would be either uh, white or some shade of gray, 
and in the other cases the, with the low temperature ones they're going to be a shade of red like uh, you would see like a brick red color slide so what do cones measure cones measure heat work which is the combined effect of the time and temperature it took to fire your product they do not just measure temperature and I'm going to show you how and why that's the case Cones indicate when the firing is complete by when they bend over. You can use them as a, uh, if you peered through the peephole of your kiln, you would actually see that. But with the advent of electronic controllers, that takes away the, the need to actually look into the kiln and uh, observe them falling. Uh, they verify that you have firing uniformity within your kiln. So if you're placing them on each shelf, and you're going to be able to observe them after the end of the firing and see uh, have they all bent to the same positions. And that gives you an indication of how uniform they, they, they fired. They uh, check the performance of your controller's thermocouple and the calibration of that thermocouple. So if you're firing to cone 06 and you place a cone 06 in your kiln and your controller is set to fire to cone 06, they should match up. If there is a difference, then you're going to have to adjust either your controller or you're going to have to add uh, some soak time, or you may choose a different uh, set of parameters to get to that uh, the result that you're wanting. Uh, what they do is they provide you a permanent record of how the firing progressed. And, and uh, I like to tell um, those who are using the logbook, or if you're interest, if you're doing it electronically, take a picture of those cones, and then save them, uh, so that you can see the visually what what did they look like. A lot of co places will take the cone out and set it up on a shelf, and they'll save a week's worth of cones. And every every uh, time they make a new firing, they'll slide one set off the shelf and they'll keep the whole set of cones uh, right there on the shelf for them to look back at. So the oldest cone goes in the garbage, the newest cone is placed up on the shelf. That way they can visually see uh, for that week's period of time, how are they all firing consistently or am I seeing some kind of shift in the way the cones are performing. Slide. So here we make at Orton, over 80 different types of cones. Uh, the, they are assigned a number. The lowest number is a 022, and the highest number is cone 42. And these are uh, some examples of where they're used and what temperatures are associated with each series of cones. Uh, chances are you're never going to see those cones lumber from 13 to 42. Those are used mostly by uh, industrial ceramics, uh, firing refractories, and high temperature uh, elect electronic ceramics or advanced ceramics. But what you may actually encounter in your use is uh, if you're doing any decal work, uh, working on overglazes or lusters, you're going to be in that range from 022 to 011. Uh, if you fire most of the artware and glazes that we use today, uh, somewhere between 010 to cone 3. And then uh, if you're going to be doing any stoneware or porcelain or um, durable ceramics, they're going to be somewhere between cone 4 through 12. Slide. Here's a couple of pictures of uh, these types of cones that we produce. The picture that you see to your left is uh, those are our self-supporting cones and we uh, we call them that because they will stand up on their own as you'll see there's the uh, they're, they're as I mentioned earlier a tapered pyramid shape they have a, a base that's going to hold them up and uh, they're going to deform once they reach the right time and temperature the upper right, those are our large cones. Uh, they are similar to the self-supporting cones. They stand about two inches in height, but they, they require mounting them into a plaque to keep them at the same height and angle that you would see that's fixed into the self-supporting cone. 
the lower the cones in the lower picture those are uh, those are only actually one inch in length and those are the small cones that would be used in a kiln sitter slide so what cones would you typically use in the CCSA? Well, uh, say if you're going to do a glaze firing, you're going to be using a self-supporting 07, 06, and 05. If you're going to be doing a bisque firing, uh, just to make sure your bisque is properly fired, you may refire it. You would want to use uh, probably 05, 04, and 03. And if you were going to be doing the high fire uh, porcelain or stoneware firings, you would probably go for cones five, six, and seven. Slide. So let's talk about firing. Uh, firing ceramics is a lot like baking. It, you have to have this time and temperature component. And we would never take uh, a turkey that is 20 pounds and put it in an oven and have it set for 350 degrees and after an hour pull it out and say, let's eat. You, you know that that 20-pound turkey is going to require a lot longer of time uh, than t one hour. So the same goes for ceramics. If you're going to be firing your products, you're going to want to make sure you go to uh, both, consider both time and temperature. Slide. So heat work. Heat work is the whole key to making sure that you're firing your ceramics properly. And you can fire to a set temperature and not achieve the correct result. And here I'm going to go through an example here. I like to call this my duck example. These three ducks were fired to one temperature, and each one gave a different result. Slide. This first duck we fired to the temperature of 1828 Fahrenheit, but we took it there really quick. We went there in three hours. And if you can sort of see on this, you can see that the finish of that glaze that's on that is really dull. It's kind of milky looking. The colors are not fully developed. And you can see every brush stroke and every little imperfection that is, is in that uh, formation of that duck. The, if you were to take like a metal rod and you were going to strike that duck, you would get this like a dull clunking sound. It would not ring at all. It would, it would almost just be a thud when you hit it. So that would be an indication that something is amiss in the way that this firing took place. Slide. This same duck was fired here in this example to the same temperature, 1828 Fahrenheit, but we went there really slowly. We took a 12, 14 hours to get there. And uh, obviously, he, he didn't survive. Uh, he completely melted. So the, uh, he's shiny. He, lo he looks pretty good there. The colors, you can see there's some yellow on his beak. But because of the amount of heat that got absorbed into him, he's, uh, he developed too much glass inside of his uh, body and started to slump under the weight of all of that glass that formed. Slide. So here we have a properly fired duck. He went to 1828 Fahrenheit. We fired him to cone 06, and we took about six hours to do so. You can see that the glaze is nice and shiny. The colors are vibrant, and they're fully developed, and the, he's not melted at all. He's still standing as, as we expect him to. And if you were to take and tap him with a metal uh, object, he would, he would ring. You would have this definite kind of chime that would uh, take place when you were hitting him. So that would be an indication that you fired properly. Slide. So what happens uh, when you're firing your, your ceramics? Uh, these things are important to know because if you get a, a problem later on, you can hopefully attribute it to some of these uh, reactions that are taking place. from. The temperature in your room temperature to about 500 degrees Fahrenheit, that time or that temperature range is when water that's within the ceramic starts to come out. It's going to boil or evaporate at uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you have any oils, uh, either you're sweating or uh, you're handling your, your, uh, your object and you're putting it in the kiln and you've just finished eating a ham sandwich, 
uh, you've got oils on your hands that could be deposited onto the wear. You want to make sure your hands are clean. You're not sweating a lot. You adding water to the uh, to ceramic as you're putting it in there because that's going to come out and it's going to uh, leave a residue. Or if you don't get it done properly, it's going to give you a problem later. Um, from 500 degrees Fahrenheit to 950 degrees is when you're going to start to burn out the organics. Uh, any ceramic that is made today is going to contain minerals and uh, clays and other items that contain residue of organic matter. It's going to either be uh, in the form of uh, decomposed clay uh, or uh, plant material, uh, bugs or, or any kind of uh, uh, living tissue that may have decomposed or become part of that clay or mineral. And those are usually burnt off between this range from 500 to 950 degrees Fahrenheit. And they start to evolve out uh, in the form of a gas. Um, now, those, all those organics are comprised of uh, carbon. We're all carbon-based living materials. So that carbon is going to need to oxidize. And that, occur, that occurs during what we call the red heat range. And that is from 950 degrees Fahrenheit to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if you were to look into your kiln at that point, you would see it's starting to have a dull red color. And then as the higher it gets in temperature, that red becomes more prominent. Uh, at that in this temperature range, carbon that was from the organics is going to start looking for some oxygen to attach to so that it can, it can be uh, moved out of, the, uh, out of the clay or out of the glaze and pass out of the, uh, the kiln. And the more oxygen we have in there, the better for the attaching to the carbon. If it has very little oxygen, you're going to get carbon joining with one oxygen molecule and, and forming carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide is a odorless, dangerous gas that if you have uh, carbon monoxide detectors in your home that you know that, that they will go off and let you know oh, it's not safe to be in here right now. Uh, carbon monoxide is not good for you. Uh, the best thing it would be is if there's adequate oxygen in there to allow the carbon to join with two oxide molecules, oxygen molecules to form carbon dioxide. And that is uh, our best case scenario. But at any, at any rate, they're still going to form, and that's what happens in this range. You also have what we call quartz expansion. And quartz is, is another term for sand, S SiO2. It's probably the most abundant mineral that is uh, on the Earth's surface, and it, is, it comprised uh, the building block to uh, most ceramics that we're firing. It's, it's what causes the formation of glass. It's the building block of glass. So uh, what we know about quartz is that when it gets into this 950 to 1200 degree Fahrenheit range, it's going to expand when it gets into that range. So you have this, this expansion of the ceramics uh, as, as they're being heated. And that's why we ask for you to make sure you have adequate spacing between your, your ceramics when you're firing them, because they do grow a little bit when they're fired. And if they're all crowded together, they're going to push up against each other, and that could cause a problem. Uh, either the glazes are going to end up sticking together, or uh, you may develop some cracks in the, in the firing. Uh, that expansion also has to be taken slowly. If, it go, if you're firing too quickly in this temperature range, that, that volume change that the, that the clay goes through, if it's taken too quickly, will be severe, and it will cause stresses in the ceramic, and they will crack. Uh, so that's important that we make sure that we're, uh, we're going at a, a decent uh, firing rate when we get into this quartz expansion. Uh, later on, you're also going to start devolving uh, maybe sulfur or fluorine are going to also want to combine with either water vapor or um, oxygen in the kiln to form uh, some type of hydrocarbon or a, um, 
a, a, a low, uh, not a very strong acid, but a weak acid. Uh, these other two effects from 1380, where you get the calcite breaking down, uh, that's usually non-consequential to, to what happens uh, to our ceramics, but it, and the, also the gypsum breaking down above 1250. They usually don't come into play for us, but if uh, you have, for example, with the gypsum, if you have uh, somebody forming your ceramics from a plaster mold, which is what gypsum is, and somehow uh, uh, they're not careful about making sure that the mold is intact when they're releasing the clay from it, you may get a little bit of residue of the gypsum in the clay. And when that breaks down, it could cause problems in the form of a pinhole or a defect in your piece later on. Slide. So I hope I didn't spend a whole lot of time uh, too long on that, but uh, I think it's important to know those. Uh, so there's no single way to fire a kiln when you develop a firing schedule. Each firing needs to be adjusted for the size of your load, the type of wear that you're being you're wanting to fire, is it going to be glaze or is it going to be bisque wear, um, and the firing char characteristics of your kiln. Uh, each kiln being different, you, you get to know what, uh, what your kiln can handle. Uh, if you find that it's always hot in one spot, you may find that, you know, I don't want to put uh, large items into that hot spot because they may deform or they may not come out properly. So it, just get a, through the use of your uh, logbook, you're going to be developing the data and information that you need to, to assess how you're going to fire your products. So, but generally, you don't want to fire fast, and especially be hope before you get to the red heat zone, you want to make sure that you don't overload your kilns, that uh, if you do so, you may, your kiln may not be able to keep up and uh, a lot of these electronic controllers will let you know that if that's the case. They're going to give you some code that says your firing uh, isn't progressing properly, and it, it'll give you some error code. Uh, if you're firing greenware, make sure you've uh, allowed enough time for the greenware to evolve those carbon-forming materials and get enough oxygen in there to convert the, C, the carbon to CO2. And uh, if you have a piece that's really thickly, uh, thick wall, you want to take them slowly uh, just because of the fact that it takes more time for the heat to penetrate into them. So uh, as a rule of thumb, two hours as you go through to the red heat, that's, that's usually important. Now this last part that I put on here, do not use the kiln as a dryer. That is probably one of the most uh, dangerous things that you could possibly do is, is put your items in wet uh, and, and, oh, that's okay, I'm just going to turn my kiln on low and let the kiln dry my items out before we progress up. One of the biggest things that you could do, uh, do wrong is to introduce water vapor into your kiln. Uh, so the best thing to do is make sure that your, your items are dry before you put them in there. Uh, a nice check to see that you've got a dry piece is just take it and place it up on your uh, next to your cheek. If it feels cool to the touch, uh, chances are there's water still in there. Um, place, a, place it in front of a fan for an hour or two, and it should be enough to uh, drive off that little bit of water that's left in there. Slide. Okay, so... When Orton talks about using cones, we always talk about using three cones. And uh, they, we've, we call that our three cone system. And it, it helps you to determine the effect of heat work. Slide. So what is this three cone system? It's, it's what we call the guide cone, the firing cone, and the guard cone. Our guide cone is the cone that is one temperature below or one cone number below your, tire, your target. Um, it's going to be the indication that your, your firing is approaching the target of your firing cone. It should always be bent over completely, and it should, 
it, it, if it isn't, then it, it would indicate an underfiring. Your firing cone is your target. He's, he's where you want the, uh, the firing to be progressed to. And his position at the end of the firing should be anywhere from uh, touching the tip of the cone to the shelf or uh, some position of um, maybe an inch or two up from the shelf. The guard cone is precisely what that. He should stand there at attention. He should never bend over. And he should just uh, let you know that you did not overshoot. If you do see some movement in the guard cone where the tip is starting to deform, that would indicate that you had somewhat of an overfiring slide. Okay, hopefully this, uh, this video will start progressing for you. Uh, what we have in this video is uh, where we're peering through a peephole into a kiln that's at, at red heat. And it's approaching the temperature at which this cone is uh, deforming. And you'll see, hopefully here in a second, too, that uh, the first cone is bending. And after that, the middle cone is our firing cone. He's going to start to deform. And we're going to start the time. Uh, there should be a clock that comes up. And then you'll see this clock show the um, temperature as it's progressing. And you can see that when this firing cone ends, it will uh, be at what we call 90 degrees. And that is the position at which we consider the cone to be fully uh, fired properly. Uh, the Tom, amount of, yes. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, for some reason, the video is not loading on this presentation. I'm okay. Sorry. All right. Well, um, if anyone would like to see this video, uh, if you go to Orton's web link, we should be able to get that up on our um, video section of our website. Uh, what you can see then is just it, it allows you the observing of what happens to a cone as it goes through a firing. Okay, so let's just slide on through the next cone, or next uh, slide. How dependable are these cones? Uh, first of all, cones do not age. If you have a set of cones that have been on a shelf in a dry location uh, for 20 years, they're going to be uh, perform the same today as they did 20 years ago. Uh, they're made from materials that we dig up from the earth, and they're stable there. They're, they're just uh, clay uh, minerals like uh, silica or uh, feldspar, things that are uh, stable, non-changing minerals. Uh, the, the nice thing about cones is that we have had them calibrated. Uh, the NIST that I've referred to there is the National Institute of standards of testing. And what we've done, what was done years ago is a set of cones were sent to this organization and they tested them and they came back with uh, test results t to show us um, what temperature and time was required to make this specific, uh, a specific cone number deform. We set that original set of cones aside and we use those now. Uh, to, to fire with every new batch of cones that we make to make sure that we are making them perform the same. So when we say that we have standard cones, we're, we are measuring them against an established standard as di dictated by this organization called NIST. Uh, we use min minerals that are very standard to the ceramics industry so that they have very similar characteristics to what you end up firing. So the behavior of a cone is very be, uh, similar to the behavior of uh, your ceramics. Slide. So we know through the over 100 year history of making cones, what kind of things affect the way a cone before, performs. We know that they have to be a specific weight, that the mounting angle and height needs to be controlled, that the density of the cone is important, what materials we choose to make them out of is very important. So what we've done, uh, our engineers have designed a quality program that makes sure that we are controlling those factors so that when you're getting a cone, you're not going to see hardly any difference from one batch to the next. And since they do not age and they, uh, they can be relied upon to be an indication 
that won't degrade just like the thermocouples do and the electronic controllers do. So a cone is a very uh, simple and easy method for determining the uh, consistency and uniformity of your firing. Uh, what happens there is that gravity causes the cone to bend over as it forms uh, some glass uh, when it approaches the window in which it will deform. Slide. So I mentioned earlier about looking at cones and being able to determine whether they uh, are indicating something other than temperature. Here uh, is what happens with cones that have been fired too quickly through the red heat zone. If you happen to get a cone that looks like this, then you can pretty much assess that something was not done properly in the firing of your kiln. Uh, we call these bloated cones because they have um, the, the carbon is actually what caused that. It, trapped, it was trapped inside the cone. There was not enough oxygen in the kiln to properly convert to CO2 or even CO, and uh, that extra carbon causes the cones to deform improperly. So they would actually bend over at a temperature much later than expected in this particular case. Slide. So let's talk about venting. Is it needed? Uh, we've, we talked a little bit here about the formation of CO and CO2 and the other gases that can, can come out of the uh, ceramics through the evolution of the organics. Well, those, those items can be detrimental to the uh, ceramics that you're firing. You need to get those to be swept out of the kiln. And uh, the, uh, the, everything that we know that we fire produces some form of carbon monoxide or other gas. And the fumes that are associated with those, if you allow them to just escape out of the kiln and come into the room where you're working, uh, you may get headaches. Well, you're likely to get headaches. Uh, they can cause you to have like a sore throat or some irritation to your to your. Uh, and even if you get into the uh, case where you're really producing a lot of that uh, carbon monoxide or other fumes, it can actually make you sick. Slide. So we we talked about where the fumes come from. Uh, all ceramic materials are going to produce those when they're fired. Uh, that oxidation process is very important to make sure that you're producing uh, carbon, or carbon dioxide instead of monoxide. And to be able to convert all these other uh, items into a, a hydrocarbon that will be passed out of the kiln. Uh, venting allows you to bring in some air to replace the oxygen that is being used up in the conversion of that carbon to carbon dioxide or monoxide. And you're going to find that in all of the clays and talcs that, uh, that we're firing in our kilns today. Uh, the moisture that's also in there can, uh, can form with fluorine. And fluorine, in the combination with hydrogen, will form a, a, an acid that actually can etch glass. And if you have um, maybe a studio where you fired uh, a lot of times without a vent and the, you, you have a window in there, you may see that the, the windows are starting to look a little frosty. Uh, that's actually an indication that you have uh, hydrofluoric acid being generated. Slide. So what does a vent do? The vent actually brings in fresh air. It, it removes those fumes and keeps them from being in the room itself uh, and expels them to the outside so that uh, they can be diluted safely out in the out of doors. Uh, what we have found also with venting is uh, it helps in the development of the colors that you may uh, be firing. Some of them are pretty sensitive to whether they're in uh, an atmosphere that has enough oxygen. So if you're bringing in some fresh air uh, with the use of a vent, it will help to develop those colors. When it also will extend the life of your heating elements and the other exposed metal parts that are in the inside of your kiln. Uh, 
Uh, one of those metal parts that's very crucial that I mentioned earlier is that thermocouple. And that bead of the thermocouple, if it's exposed to those uh, reducing elements, uh, those uh, hydrocarbons and other fumes, it can actually cause that metal part to degrade quicker. And also, it, in those fumes, if allowed to deposit onto the heating elements, would cause the heating elements to de degrade and become less effective quicker over time. So we want to sweep those fumes out uh, by introducing the fresh air that is needed to complete the organic conversion. Now, the last thing that you see on this slide is that we get improved temperature uniformity inside the kiln when we use a vent. And that's mainly by use of a downdraft vent slide. Downdraft vents, um, which is the same vent that we produce here called the Vent Master, it will bring air in from the top of the kiln and then it draws it out through the bottom. And if you know about the way heat is generated, uh, heat rises. And you may notice that in the summertime. Uh, the top of your house, if you have to, uh, air conditioning going, it may be hotter on the top level and cooler on the bottom. And in the reverse in the wintertime, you may find that uh, your, the top of the house is hot and the bottom is cool. It's because heat rises. So what we're going to do with a downdraft vent is we're going, to, we're going to work that to our advantage. We're going to start pulling air in from the top and draw it down to the bottom to, to try to uniformly uh, distribute that heat. Um, we get fewer firing problems when we use a downdraft vent. We get truer colors. You get the temperature uniformity. You get complete removal of those fumes. Uh, don't allow them to escape from the kiln in the first place. Uh, trap them into the vent and blow them to the outside. Uh, you have a safer kiln operation. If you do it the old way where you vent your kiln by opening the lid and letting those uh, fumes escape before you reach red heat, and then you come back later, you're going to have to put on some gloves. You're going to have to lift that uh, prop out from the lid and safely lower the lid down and then uh, continue on with your firing. Uh, that's a danger in itself in that you're approaching a hot kiln, you're allowing the fumes to escape. You really don't want to be going that way. Uh, make your, your life so much easier, use the vent, and make sure that you're uh, protecting yourself and also your investment. Uh, when you look at the use of a vent, a uh, downdraft vent, if you have a full hood vent, those require a lot of makeup air and you, uh, they, they move a lot of air, but the way they operate is they allow the fumes to escape from the kiln and they capture them above the kiln and then extract them out. Uh, you, you don't need to do the, uh, enter into those high cost installations if you're using one of the downdraft vents that we uh, produce. Slide. Okay, so let's get into some of these firing problems. Uh, hopefully you've never seen any of these before, but uh, these are some examples of uh, what we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Uh, this lower uh, picture, if you can see it properly, the lower right-hand side, that is an example of uh, what we call crawling. And uh, I don't get into that later on here, so I'm going to touch on it now. Crawling is uh, usually due to um, oils or some kind of... Uh, compound that got onto the bisque ware and then you paint it over top of it and when the glaze starts to uh, develop it's going to repel away from the area where you had the, the oils or the residues or some kind of contamination that got onto the, the, the bisque ware and that's what uh, causes that uh, separation of the glaze. Uh, it also is uh, attributed to um, applying a glaze way too heavy. If it's uh, somebody's pretty heavy-handed, uh, that could also be the contributing factor to crawling. Slide. Okay, so what problems can be caused by full, the poor firing practices? We can have cracking. We can have poorly developed colors. We can have bubbles or craters in the glaze. We can have pinholes, shivering, crazing pinholes, or a dull glaze finish. Slide. So most problems occur because the heat is uh, 
heating is done too quickly or you cooled too quickly. Uh, you have improper ventilation uh, because you didn't have a, a vent working, um, or you had uh, just chosen the wrong glaze and uh, body to, to work with. Uh, most cases you've already taken care of that, but if you get into uh, some of these other problems, there could be something uh, going on in that area. Um, the way that the greenware and the clay is mixed and prepared, that can also affect the, the way uh, products fire. Hopefully, uh, at the point that you're seeing them, you aren't going to experience any of these problems because that's taken care of by a quality uh, producer. You could have improper application of glaze. That's probably your biggest hang up in the, the CCSA group uh, where you have people coming in and working on a piece by themselves. Either they've applied the glaze way too thin or they, they're very heavy handed on it. Uh, a lot of that could be out of your control, but you can see uh, later on where they can cause some of these problems. Um, and the last being you did not properly dry the wear before you fired it. Slide. Okay, so here we've got examples of shivering and crazing. So let's talk about what that means. Slide. Shivering. Shivering is when you get big flakes of glaze that just fall off the piece. Uh, they they uh, can have a residue of the bisque wear attached to it, but they come off in like big razor sharp sheets, uh, catastrophic to the piece that you're making. Crazing is the exact opposite of what happens when shivering takes place. It's when the glaze cracks in a spider web pattern, and you get these fine uh, cracks all through the piece. Slide. So what causes these? Uh, a lot of times it's because the bisque wear is not properly fired, and or you have incomplete or incompatibility between the glaze and the bisque, uh, you could have too thick an application of glaze. Uh, you could also have oil or dust or some kind of manufacturing defect. And those are uh, rare in most cases. Uh, if you see something that happens only once in a while, then it's probably due to something like this. But if you're seeing something happen on a very consistent and uh, all the time basis, that uh, it can point to the uh, application the incompatibility issue between the glaze and the bisque. Um, rushing your firing process. If you go too quickly through your heating and cooling, you can actually cause too many stresses because of the difference in the, uh, the way that the quartz expands. I talked about that earlier. If you go through that quartz inversion phase too quickly, you can cause this defect to occur. Slide. Okay, so here we got pinholes and some blisters. Uh, those are usually caused from uh, some kind of a residue that's in the in in the uh, surface of the bisque wear that you're working with, or you did not properly fire the uh, get all of the organics out of the bisque wear or the clay wear when it was fired the first time. Slide. So a pinhole being a small pin-sized hole in the glaze, uh, they can also come from uh, a little bit of residue of gypsum that we talked about earlier. Uh, if you have a little piece of plaster that comes off of a, of a mold and it gets uh, worked into the surface of the bisque wear, when it's fired, it looks just as white as the bisque does. And you won't be able to see that until after it's glazed and fired and that little pinhole uh, is, is where the uh, gypsum is uh, wanting to come out of the piece. And uh, unfortunately, if that occurs, uh, there's really no indication ahead of time to let you know that that's there. Uh, crater and or blister, that's uh, a round hole. It looks like the residue of where, like, a, like on the surface of the moon, you see these big craters and, and uh, ring around them. Uh, they're very sharp usually, and that's an indication that there's some gas evolving out of the of the bisque, and it's passing through the glaze, and it's forming a bubble as it's doing so. And when that bubble bursts, it leaves that ring, and they usually are occurring right at the peak temperature of your firing. 
Uh, nine times out of ten, that's because the bisque wear wasn't properly fired, and you, you're evolving some kind of a gas uh, in a carbonaceous gas coming out of the bisque wear. Slide. So the cause of that, you can have uh, heavy glaze application. They, if there's going to be an issue and you apply some glaze heavily, it's going to magnify the problem. Uh, firing too fast, always an issue. If you don't, you don't want to do that. Uh, Underfired bisque, poor ventilation, uh, incomplete burnout of your organic material. So uh, make sure you're, you're firing slowly through your red heat, and uh, you're not going to uh, push the rate of firing. Slide. And milky dull finish. Now, if you go back to my result earlier for where the uh, I had the duck example, this would be an indication of a firing that was done too quickly or didn't have enough time to develop the glaze properly. Slide. So here we are, incorrect heat work, under firing, or too heavy an application of glaze. Slide. Okay, so let's, what kind of tips did we gather out of this? Uh, we want to make sure that we allow time for the heat to move into the wear. We don't want to overload our kiln. Uh, using a, use your controller. Know how it works. Uh, make sure that if you um, want to add a, a step where you put in a controlled hold, uh, you know how to do so. Uh, use cones in every firing. Use that three-cone system. It's your best friend. It's your cheapest insurance to making sure that you've, uh, you've got a good witness in your kiln to what's really going on. And pay attention to how those cones look. Uh, write down in the logbook so that you have a record of what's going on. So if there is a problem, you can see uh, how, if, is it a one-time problem or has it been occurring slowly over time. Uh, you want to maintain your kiln, you want to vacuum it out, you want to conduct routine maintenance, and you want to refer to your, your kiln manufacturer's uh, manual to, to make sure you're doing what they say is important to make sure your kiln is going to live up to the life it, it expectancy it's supposed to. Uh, get yourself a kiln then if you don't already have one and use it because it will be uh, helpful to keep that kiln in its best condition and you in your best condition. Slide. Okay, so I've got a little example here I'm going to go through of uh, what we've done in, in a typical loading of a kiln. This is uh, something that I've done uh, a couple of slides for you to show you how to go about thinking, how do, how do I load my kiln right? What, what kind of process am I going to go through? Uh, first of all, you want to turn off the electrical switches. Make sure it's not going to be uh, energized at all. You want to vacuum the inside of the lid and inside of the kiln. You want to actually get up right where the heating elements are, because if you have any residue of any piece of some something that might have uh, ended up inside of those grooves where the elements are, it will damage the heating element on the next firing. So you want to get in there and vacuum it out really good. Uh, apply kiln wash to your shelves. Uh, if you're going to be firing glazes, you want to make sure that kiln wash goes up to one inch from the edge of the shelves. You don't want to go over the edges because if you're going to handle your shelves and you have kiln wash on them, that kiln wash that you touch with your hands could flake off and fall down on what's down below. And the kiln wash can cause a defect in the, in the surface in the form of a pinhole or some kind of a white spot on the uh, stuff that you're firing. So that kiln wash is very important to make sure your shelves are uh, going to stay in good condition. Slide. So. Plan your load. Uh, you want to distribute your load uniformly. You want to load. You want to make sure that your uh, very your your type of firing that you're doing, if it's bisque wear or glaze wear, you want to make sure that you're uh, planning your load accordingly. Your bottom shelf should be one inch above the bottom of the kiln. If you do uh, anything less than that, you're going to get into a situation where the bottom could be underfired. So one inch is a good rule of thumb. Uh, support each shelf and balance the load. Uh, you want to use three points of support with, uh, because uh, what's the most stable is, a, is a, if you get a three-legged stool, uh, that's going to be the most stable. If you get four, in, introduce four points of uh, support, 
you could be off on one of those supports and you start make, making the shelf unstable. So uh, always use just three. It's, it's the most stable form that you can use. And you want to ensure you have line of sight radiation from the heating elements. You don't want to put a large piece in front of a little piece in the center of the, the load because that little piece won't see enough of the radiation. It, think of it as sunlight. The, the, the elements are radiating sunlight into the shelf. And if you have a big piece, it's going to act as a shade, and it's not going to let the heat penetrate into a small piece that's being hidden. Slide. OK, so here I have an example of how I've loaded a kiln. Uh, it's pretty small, but uh, hopefully I'll progress through it for you. Slide. What I've done is I've placed cones on the bottom shelf, and I've arranged my pieces in such that each piece is uh, somewhat in the same height. Uh, now, th these pieces can be placed directly onto the shelf, because what I've done, even though these are glazed, I took and wiped off the glaze from the bottom of the, of the piece so that it, it's what we call dry foot slide. OK, so I've organized the light shapes. I've built up another layer. And uh, you can see on the, the posts are being lined up right above each other. Now, I've got some uneven shapes here that I need to account for. I don't have the ability to uh, utilize everything. So I've taken some bowls, and I put them in the front. And you can see the cones on the next shelf behind that slide. So now I'm using half shelves. I will place a half, I put another shelf over top of the bowls, and I put another shelf on the top of the other pieces in the back. Uniform shapes, uniform sizes. The next layer is then put on top with the last layer of cones, and I have left enough space that would allow for the the kiln lid to be placed over top of that. Um, so you can just imagine that I now have the kiln. This is what you would see on the inside of the kiln. Slide. So here's the pieces after they've been fired. Notice the supports are all continuous, and the, uh, everything is being supported properly. Slide. So here now, um, I've started to unload the kiln. And you can see the cones on the bottom and the middle and the top all shaped about the same the way that we want them. The, the uh, guard cone is standing up, the, the firing cone is bent over, and the guard cone is completely over. Slide. And there you have the final result. Now notice I can fire uh, the reds and the greens together, because this was fired in a kiln that had a vent. Slide. So your tools for success, self-supporting cones, temperature controllers, and kiln vents. If you use all these tools, you should have uh, continued success. Slide. I invite you to come to our website and cruise through it. We have some resources on there. You can get any of these items that I'm talking about there. And this below is my email. If you ever have a question, I would invite you to send me an email with your question. I'd be happy to help you answer them. And at this point, I would be happy to enter, entertain answering any of your questions. All right. Well, thank you so much. I learned a ton today. So thank you so much. Um, I know we're a little bit long here. If anyone has any questions, please type them into the chat area. We don't have any questions so far, so I'll give you all just a second to type any of your questions. I'm sorry. Sometimes I was not the best slide turner. No, uh, okay. I'm sorry that there was some difficulty, but. Uh, all right, Melanie wants to know, does the position of a kiln shelf near the thermal couple affect the temperature reading? Yes, it would. That is also a very good question. Uh, you want to maintain at about the same distance away from a shelf as you would from the bottom. So uh, think of uh, a one-inch gap between the tip of a thermal couple to anything that's near it. Uh, if you have something that's too close, it's going to affect the ability of that thermocouple to read the temperature properly. So I would say make sure you keep a one-inch uh, barrier or window around the thermocouple at all times. All right. Um, <clears throat> Deborah says that you stated that you fired green and red together. Is that really a problem? Uh, now, nowadays, it isn't so much of a problem as it used to be. Uh, the glazes that I used in that example uh, 
those glazes uh, contained carb, uh, copper and cadmium, which are materials that you aren't going to be getting a hold of nowadays. And also those glazes, because as sh the shine that you saw on them, those were um, from a time when we were able to use lead. And that is a no-no anymore. So um, the, the, the whole example is still true in the form of those, uh, the glazes that are used today are uh, lead-free glazes, and they are very sensitive to temperature. And you need to make sure that you uh, control that properly or you're not going to get the, cor the correct finish. Uh, there are some colors that are subject to uh, fading if you don't fire in a highly oxidized situation. So um, that was a very severe case example uh, that, I, that I showed there. All right. Um, at times I hear crackling, uh, or yeah, crackling while, uh, the kiln is, while the kiln is cooling. Is that normal? It is normal, and uh, that is actually what I, uh, as the kiln is cooling back down, that quartz inversion that I talked about, that's a reversible thing. So as it as it's heated, you're gonna you're not gonna hear it crackling because the kiln's closed up. But as it's cooling, if you have your kiln opened up too soon, you may be hearing that crackling occurring. Uh, if it's if it's like snap, crackle, pop, going very fast and very furious, you might want to close that kiln up again and let it cool some more because that is an indication that you're 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 uh, stressing the the items, but. If it's just occasional pop that you hear every once in a while, that's normal. And um, you might say the next step is, well, when is it safe to open a kiln? Uh, if you see your temperature controller is 200 degrees, any time from 200 degrees down, I would say that's safe. It would be a uh, rule of thumb like you would, you're not going to open up your, your kiln or your oven, at, your oven in your kitchen and reach in and just grab something out red hot uh, without wearing gloves. Uh, if you can't reach in and safely take items out of your kiln with with some gloves on, then you you're going at it too quick. You should let it cool down. The vent, if you leave the vent on entirely through the cooling, it will it'll assist and it'll ac actually get the the kiln down to room temperature quicker. All right. Um Noel is uh new to firing and she wants to know does the dry foot method make a difference in the piece being food safe? And do stilt marks make a difference in this too? Good question. Um, dry footing in what you're firing in the CCSA group is a porous talc body. And they, uh, when you dry foot, you, you, you expose some of the bisque to uh, an area that is not glazed. If that area were to come in contact with moisture or water, say you put it into uh, a dishwasher or you were to hand wash that item later, it's going to still absorb water into the bisque and it's going to be a possible uh, problem later on if you were to put that into the microwave or uh, a hot beverage into it, it's going to cause it to expand or that the water that's in there is going to want to go somewhere and a lot of times it causes cracks to, to form later on. So food safeness-wise, what, what, what we're talking about is, is it going to allow for um, food residue or bacterial growth inside of the, the, the piece? And in the most cases, if it is dry-footed, it is going to allow for some moisture to get in there or something in the form of a, a liquid residue, coffee, who knows what? Uh, you can't perf you can't make an item completely food safe uh, if you're going to dry foot it, unless you're going to. Most of the time, dry footing is done on items that become vitreous as they're fired, and that's usually the stoneware or the high fire ceramics. Uh, the stilting that you do is going to leave a small pinpoint or an area where there is still the ability for water to get into. Uh, so you're, you're never going to be completely foolproof when you, when you stilt or dry foot. Right. I hope that answered the question. All right. Um, are certain colors more likely to shiver than others? 
Um, Deborah seems to have issues with red and teal. Uh, yes, there are some colors that tend to be, uh, let's say, persnickety, if <laughs> that's a word. Uh, and it has to do with the type of, of uh, color that's used, the, the, the makeup of that color. In, in, in some of these glazes that you're applying, they want the highest depth of color and, uh, and the most uh, ability to get one stroke on there and have it full coverage without uh, looking bled out or or weak, um, and, and the way they do that is they have to load a lot of pigment into the glaze, and when you get into those situations, it can cause the glaze to be right on the edge of trouble, and um, so the the glaze manufacturers try to do their best to make sure that they formulated the glazes so that they're going to be as foolproof as possible. But if you get into a situation where you apply that glaze, that's a troublesome glaze too heavy, it can cause that magnification of a problem where you get right into the shivering. But um, it, it's usually a uh, manuf it, it's usually controlled on the manufacturer's level. All right. Does anyone else have any more questions? I don't see anything here in just a second pop up. Oh, we have one that says yes. Sorry, so she's typing a question right now. Okay. And um, I will, uh, I don't have a slide that has your email address on it, but I will make sure that your email is on the uh, follow-up that I send uh, out to everyone after this. Okay. Do you want to go ahead and just state your email address right now? And yeah, it's, it's McInerney at OrtonCeramic.com. That is M-C-I-N-N-E-R-N-E-Y. The at symbol, O R T O N C E R A M I C dot com. Great. Thank you. Okay. Ashley's still typing first. Um, her current cone is 06. It's set to 350 degrees per hour. Is that firing too quickly? I have recently experienced milky glazes after firing. Um, well, is she if you're using an electronic controller to do your firing and you use the cone fire mode, it will automatically adjust the temperature uh, through the stages that it's going to be firing through. Chances are it's not completely running at that same rate through the whole firing. Uh, typically the controllers slow the firing down right at the end on a, um, on a rate of say 100 100 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit per hour uh, as they approach the, the final temperature. If you are going at 300 degrees at the beginning of your firing, I would say, yeah, that's too quick. You would want to um, somehow get that thing to slow down. Uh, there are uh, controller con options, I believe, that allow you to choose um, in some some controllers I've seen where they say fast glaze, medium glaze, or slow glaze, uh, I would try the slow and see uh, see what kind of result you get because it, nine times out of ten it makes the products look better. All right. She wants to know also, um, can she refire these and at what cone? There are some issues that uh, defects that can be refired and they solve the problem. Uh, say if you have a single pinhole or a small defect and you want to apply a little bit of glaze over top of that and refire it, um, it can make the, glaze, the, the item uh, usable after that. But in the case of something like shivering or crazing, it usually is permanent. You aren't going to be, if you, if you get to try to fix it, something else pops up in another spot in the subsequent firing. Um, it's very uh, hit and miss as far as that goes. Um, if you, I would say if you see a piece that's shivering, call it, call it a, a day and move on to another piece because you're never going to be able to be sure you've solved that issue. Uh, but if you uh, have a glaze firing that's needing to go to 06 and you apply more glaze, you want to go right back to an 06. You don't want to fire a little cooler. 
All right. Um, and just so you all know, um, we have uh, on the CCSA website, you can uh, check there's a poster uh, that you can print out in uh, the technical area of our website that will show you uh, pictures very similar to the ones in Tom's presentation. And this presentation will also be on our website later today. So um, Ashley said thank you. That's perfect. And uh, if there are no more questions, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. And uh, I just want to thank you. you. This was phenomenal information. Thank you so much for um, your level of knowledge so far in advance. Um, it was wonderful to have you on this call. So, so thank you for doing this for us. Oh, I appreciate it. So, all right, and I will uh, I will end here and close out this recording, and I will send everyone uh, a link to the recording later this afternoon and uh, a link to the uh, slides as well. And uh, I hope you all have a great day. Thanks so much.